Welcome again to the Internet History Podcast. I'm your host, Brian McCullough. This is part three of chapter one. And in chapter one, we're continuing to look at Netscape. When we last left things, Netscape Navigator had been released to the internet and had quickly become a monster success. The young company had no intention of resting on its laurels, however. And indeed, no sooner was Netscape 1.0 out the door than the company started work on version 2.0. Navigator 1.0 had quickly established itself as the gold standard for web browsing, but Mark Andreessen's vision was to keep the hits coming and make successive versions of Navigator the gold standard for just about everything else he wanted to do on the internet. Navigator 2.0 would include a full email client for the first time. Newsgroup readers and FTP programs would follow. Just as importantly, Navigator 2.0 would support the new Java programming language, continuing Netscape's commitment to making the web a more dynamic medium. Netscape itself developed JavaScript to help build upon Java. And of course, Netscape allowed for third parties to write plugins that could be added to Navigator and make the browser even better. The product launches the server software was released around the beginning of 1995, couldn't have come soon enough. It's a little-known detail, but Netscape actually came dangerously close to running out of money at the end of 1994, the beginning of 1995. Jim Clark was scaling up the company for the big time, but he was also running the company somewhat lean. He was trying to hold on to every percentage of ownership equity that he could, but his money was running out. The company had burned through much of the $13 million that Clark and Kleiner Perkins had invested in the company thus far. There were, briefly, layoffs and some concern inside the company that they might burn through their remaining cash reserve. Fortunately, it was just at this moment that Jim Barksdale finally came on board as the CEO. At the beginning of 1995, Barksdale was introduced to the company by Clark, who told the assembled team members, quote, Jim is the CEO. He's the decision maker. If you disagree with him, go talk with him. Don't come to me. End quote. Barksdale brought offline, old-school business acumen to Netscape, which the company sorely needed. Thanks to Navigator's wild success, Netscape was on track to do $3 million in revenue in the first quarter of 1995, but that clearly wasn't enough to stem the cash burn. One day early in his tenure, Barksdale sat down with Bill Kellinger, who ran the sales department. At that point, the entire sales team consisted of three overworked phone representatives. The three reps were handling more than a thousand calls a day. Netscape, the company of hotshot programmers and engineers, didn't really know from sales. When Kellinger showed Barksdale the sales call volume numbers, the new CEO was aghast. They were turning away customers for the simple reason that there weren't enough people to answer the phones. Barksdale said to Kellinger, quote, If I give you more people, how much more revenue can you do? Kellinger figured that if he had just three more people on the phones for a grand total of six, he might be able to triple Netscape's revenue. Again, Barksdale was shocked. Quote, you mean you can do $9 million in the second quarter? End quote. Kellinger got his extra phone reps. And in fact, second quarter sales reached nearly $12 million on account. Barksdale also helped land a new investment round that bought Netscape some more time. The new $17 million investment round included Knight Ritter, Hearst, the Times Mirror Company, and the cable company TCI, 
and valued the company at about $150 million. Netscape was firmly on the finance world's map all of a sudden, and with good reason. Navigator and all the attendant server software soon started bringing in serious money. Sales in the first quarter of 1995 were $5 million. As we've seen, second quarter revenue more than doubled to $12 million. The kinda sorta free strategy, backed up by official licenses, was paying off. Greg Sands, the marketing guy, said, quote, Sometimes companies would call and say, Hey, I just realized I've got a thousand people who are using this product. End quote. They would pay up just to make sure they were in compliance. And the growing revenue that this provided turned the hiring spigot back on. The company's headcount would reach more than 250 by the summer of 1995. It would double that number by the end of 1995. Meanwhile, Barksdale was also helping Clark fend off some of the renewed legal threats from the University of Illinois and Spyglass. All of the buzz Navigator was generating only rubbed salt into their wounds as they saw Navigator steal market share from Mosaic. The threatening legal letters increased in severity. Word filtered back to Clark that Spyglass salespeople were possibly openly badmouthing Netscape to potential clients claiming Netscape was peddling stolen intellectual property. Clark met with Spyglass's CEO, Doug Colbeth, and continued to plead Netscape's innocence. Privately, Clark was dismissive of Spyglass for seeming to believe that the original source code and the license from the University of Illinois was the valuable part of the equation. Had Clark believed that, he could have pursued a license from the very beginning and built his browser around the Mosaic code. But Clark had always believed that it was the people, the Andreessens and the Binas and the other engineers from the NCSA, that were the truly valuable business assets. And he already had them. Had Colbeth been smart, said Clark, quote, he would have recruited at least some of the members of the Mosaic team before me. Netscape never would have happened if he had. End quote. The various legal issues were eventually settled out of court. Netscape reportedly agreed to pay the University of Illinois $2.2 million in damages, with an additional payment of $1.4 million depending on future business deals. The university split the money with Spyglass, and the parties agreed that Netscape could continue to distribute its browser without a license from either the university or Spyglass. Netscape had offered to pay with shares of the company in lieu of cash, but this was rebuffed. This refusal would cost the University of Illinois tens of millions of dollars when Netscape eventually IPO'd. And by the way, an IPO was definitely coming. It was coming in no small measure because of something Spyglass did that pushed speedy Netscape into overdrive. In mid-May 1995, Spyglass filed for an IPO of its own. On June 27, 1995, Spyglass debuted on the NASDAQ to great success, with shares rising 62% on the first day of trading. Spyglass was valued at $200 million. That was all the impetus that Jim Clark needed. At the June meeting of Netscape's board of directors, he began agitating for Netscape to do its own IPO, and the sooner the better. Barksdale and the CFO, an ex-Morgan Stanley banker named Peter Curry, weren't so sure. The traditional rule of thumb was that a company didn't go public until it had three quarters of solid revenue growth. Netscape only had two quarters of any sort of revenue at all. It was also traditional for a company to show at least three quarters of profitability before an IPO. Netscape was on track to see profitability eventually, but not until the end of the year. Then there was the fact that only six months earlier, the company had come close to running out of money. And then there was the fact, the small fact, that the company wasn't even a year and a half old at that point. Clark's own Silicon Graphics had gone public in 1986, but at that point it had been in business for five years. Jim Clark wasn't concerned with any of this. With his agitation, Netscape went ahead and filed papers for an initial public offering on June 23, 1995, a mere four days before Skyglass's debut on the market. And even this was done at Netscape speed. To make the IPO date Clark wanted, they had three weeks to get the paperwork together. 
The documentation was filed with the SEC in a mere 19 days. How could Jim Clark expect to go public at this point? It turns out that there was some precedent. The internet was already stirring interest on Wall Street. Netscape would not be the first internet stock to go public, in fact. That honor would go to the California-based internet service provider Netcom Online, which had IPO'd successfully in December 1994, valuing the company at $85 million. Netcom didn't have any profits either, but what it did have was around 40,000 subscribers paying around $20 a month to access the internet over dial-up modems. Within a few months of its initial offering, Netcom shares had doubled. And Netcom was soon followed by two more ISPs in the spring of 1995, Virginia-based PSINet and UUNet. Neither company had profits. In fact, PSINet had lost $10 million in the year before its IPO. Nonetheless, it was valued by Wall Street at more than $431 million. Internet stocks were hot even before Netscape. A young executive at Sun Microsystems was quoted by Businessweek as saying, quote, This is a rocket that has been launched. There's no one who can stop it. End quote. That quote was from Eric Schmidt, by the way, who would one day know something about rocketing internet stocks. Netscape did not have subscribers, of course, but it did have 60% market share in a young software market that seemingly had nothing but hyperbolic growth in its future. By the end of May 1995, more than 5 million copies of Navigator had been downloaded. A user base of that size had to have some market value. And at the time, software companies were the darlings of Wall Street. Software is a high-margin business. A hit software product could be a gold mine, and investors were more than willing to buy into the platform strategy that Mark Andreessen had copped from Bill Gates. Netscape would not be the first company to go public without significant profits, or even revenue to speak of, but it was the one that made it okay to do so going forward. It could do so because the investing community believed Netscape could be the next Microsoft. The splash Netscape would make with its own IPO would seemingly validate the notion that internet companies were different, and could be held to different standards of valuation. In the dot-com frenzy that would follow, Numerous IPO candidates would, and could, point to Netscape as the company that had gone public with zero revenues, only to ride the parabolic growth of the internet to hundreds of millions in revenue in a few short years. And just as importantly, Netscape made it okay to go public even if you were only a few years or even a few months old as a company. Frank Quattrone, a Morgan Stanley banker who we'll hear plenty more about in later chapters, helped take Netscape public. He remembered it this way, quote, A lot of people had missed out on the Microsoft IPO because they didn't believe in PCs and they didn't believe in software. They thought the stock was too expensive all along the way until Microsoft was worth $10 billion. Man, were they wrong. There had been enough talk about the internet, and John Doerr had done a good job of evangelizing it. People were looking for the next platform. Where am I going to be able to find the next Microsoft? Who's the next Bill Gates? What's the next high-margin opportunity that's going to change the entire landscape of technology? So it was the opportunity to be the standard bearer, the Microsoft of this new era. End quote. We should also not forget that Jim Clark had personal reasons for wanting to go public so quickly. This was his second act, his revenge after all, his chance to right the wrongs he felt had been done to him at Silicon Graphics. He had funded Netscape himself, and he had avoided taking outside VC money for as long as he could. When he finally took money from Kleiner Perkins, he had driven a hard bargain. Clark had demanded Kleiner Perkins invest in Netscape, but not dilute his personal holdings too much, and he had been successful. By the time the discussions about an IPO took place in the summer of 1995, Jim Clark retained a 20% ownership in the company. If Netscape IPO'd successfully, Jim Clark would finally make the fortune he felt was his due. Every IPO is preceded by what is called a roadshow. 
where the principals in the firm go around the country pitching their company as an investment to stock analysts, investors, mutual funds, pension funds, and the like. Netscape's Roadshow was like the world tour of a young pop star or teen idol. In New York, people were turned away when a 500-person ballroom was filled to capacity. Netscape's chief financial officer recalled that, quote, When we went from city to city, instead of meeting with three or four analysts in a given institutional investment firm, we'd have 50 or 75. And it wasn't all people who were going to buy the stock. They wanted to know about the Internet. Many of the questions we got had more to do with the Internet as a cultural phenomenon, end quote. A lot of the excitement centered around the story of the company itself. Again, Andreessen was the poster boy, Clark was the business legend, Doerr was the investing legend, and Barksdale was the proven executive and guru. The ex-Apple man, Mike Homer, was in charge of milking the IPO for PR purposes. He remembered, quote, I did everything I could to package Mark and Clark. We had this cool guy, and the other guy is like Yoda. It's so good as a story for the press. Then you throw Barksdale into it, and it was like, oh man, this is a whole new toy. As a PR and marketing person, it's like, holy mackerel, I've got a Jedi council here. End quote. The Netscape IPO was the biggest thing Silicon Valley had seen in a long, long time. For the first time in years, there was fire in the valley again. Netscape seemed to have bottled it, and Wall Street was ready to buy it. Again, the banker Frank Quatrone. Quote, the closest thing to it that Morgan Stanley had seen was Apple's IPO in 1980. Everyone wanted this one. It was a trophy, the thing you had to get to be able to talk at cocktail parties. No one wanted to tell their grandchildren that they missed out on this one. End quote. Netscape had originally planned to sell 3.5 million shares of stock. At the last minute, the decision was made to sell 5 million shares. And even that wasn't enough. Investors placed orders for 100 million shares. The day before the IPO, Barksdale was still on the East Coast, finishing up the final stages of the roadshow. Riding in a fleet of limousines with a group of bankers and stock analysts, Barksdale was constantly on his cell phone trying to settle on an offer price. Outside of Baltimore, his caravan hit a dead zone where there was no cell reception. Barksdale had the fleet of limos pull off at a truck stop so that he and the bankers could use a bank of pay telephones. It looked like a mafia convention, he said later. The morning of the IPO, Barksdale had given strict instructions that Netscape employees should not discuss the stock price and should instead keep working like it was business as usual. But when Jim Clark got into the office that morning, he noticed that his own personal assistant, Deanne Scherning, Netscape's employee number three, who was the one that changed the sheets on the futons that the engineers slept on sometimes, she had ignored the injunction and had put a live electronic ticker tape above her desk. Clark decided not to reprimand Sherding, partly out of affection for her, she was a shareholder too, after all, but partially because the price on the ticker tape was stuck at 28, the offering price. Why wasn't the stock open yet? Clark was as curious as anyone else about that. For his part, Mark Andreessen wasn't even awake. He had been up until about three the night before, working on some Netscape issue or another, and so when he woke up at 11 a.m. and logged into Quote.com, the stock was finally trading, so he missed out on all the drama of the delayed open. As he would remember it later, Quote, Then I went back to sleep. End quote. In Netscape's offices that morning, the phones were ringing off the hook. Out of the blue, there were news vans parked in the parking lot. Jim Clark went back to Sherning's desk to see his secretary frantically trying to fend off everyone in the world who suddenly wanted to talk to him. Her electronic ticker was bouncing around wildly above her. Clark reached out and shook her hand. Well... I told you I'd make you a millionaire, he told her, and I have. Netscape was Jim Clark's billion-dollar company number two. 
His secretary was a millionaire, thanks to her stock options. We've already mentioned that Andreessen was suddenly worth $58 million. Jim Clark's holdings were $663 million. And Jim Barksdale did fine as well. During the original efforts to bring him on board, Clark had awarded Barksdale several million shares of his own, which were now worth about $250 million. And remember the original NCSA team and how they had been wooed by Clark with 100,000 shares each? Those 100,000 shares were now worth close to $6 million. In fact, they would be worth $17 million in just a few months' time. And all this had happened in the space of two years, not in the five years that Clark had originally estimated back at the University Inn in Illinois. So much of the phenomenon of the Netscape moment, as the excitement around the IPO would come to be called, focused on that sudden immense wealth. It wasn't just the bigwigs who were getting rich, it was the engineers, the secretaries. In his rush to go big and hire big, Jim Clark had been generous with everyone he wanted to recruit. The stock option as a recruiting tool gained currency with the very first internet company. The cherished Silicon Valley idea that all you had to do was pick the right company and get in early enough so that even you, a lowly engineer, could make $10 million. That was making the whole world take notice. Netscape started the gold rush for everyone and everything, for engineers, for IPOs, for stocks, and for cockeyed business plans. A lot of the press coverage from the time was just people wrapping their minds around the sudden easy wealth that this new era could bring. In the Time Magazine article from the issue with the barefoot Mark Andreessen on the cover, the reporter took time up front to provide a basic primer on what was happening. It went like this, quote, The wealth comes from initial public offerings of stock, or IPOs, which are experiencing an unprecedented boom in the great bull market of the last two years. More capital was raised in IPOs by emerging high-tech firms in 1995, $8.4 billion, than in any other year in U.S. history. And when an IPO is successful, the people who already hold shares in the company make out well, sometimes very well, sometimes unbelievably well, end quote. It was also the sheer speed of events that blew people's minds. It had taken 12 years before you could begin to talk about all the millionaires that Microsoft had minted, beyond Gates, Allen, and Balmer, the founders and executives, in other words. Netscape had done it in 15 months. Again, you just had to pick the right startup and get in early. If you chose wisely, you didn't even have to stay there that long. You might have to work your ass off for a while, sure, but... Netscape taught people lightning could strike after only a couple years or even a few months. Wall Street and Silicon Valley had learned valuable lessons as well. The web and the internet in general, they were a wild west, a land grab as we've said. The key was to get there first and dominate before competition could even notice. Mark Andreessen's platform strategy seemed suddenly to be a proven concept. Early profits were not important at all. Revenue, that was important, but not entirely a requirement. The more valuable thing was to show a sense of Netscape speed, the ability to be nimble and willing to chase markets and market share. The sense of your moment in history and the opportunity in front of you, and a willingness to go after it immediately. As Michael Lewis described it in The New New Thing, quote, you had to show that you were the company not of the present, but of the future. The most appealing companies became those in a state of almost pure possibility. End quote. The bottom line was, nobody knew how big this internet thing could be. Netscape had shown that it could be very big indeed, but the sky was probably not even the limit. Anything you could think up could be virtually created on the internet. Anything and any market that might exist in the real world could be duplicated on and possibly disrupted by the internet. And the internet was continuing to explode in growth. By 1995, there were still only maybe 20 million people on the internet. By 
the possibility existed that someday everyone in the world, all six billion people or so, would eventually come online. So, from 20 million to six billion. It's not every day that there's a market with growth possibilities like that. Not even once in a lifetime. Possibly the only other time it had happened in the history of capitalism was during the Industrial Revolution. Here was a new revolution, a digital and virtual one, and all you had to do to get rich from it was just stand in front of the tidal wave of history and let it wash over you. When entrepreneurs and financiers internalized that lesson, the internet boom was well and truly on. The sky's the limit possibility of Netscape was that it could possibly become the next Microsoft. If computing was going to move to the internet, then all sorts of things could move to the internet. You would live and work and play online, and in that sort of future, when Netscape was the internet's operating system, replacing the old PC operating systems like Windows and DOS, it would be Mark Andreessen's platform strategy, but for this whole new limitless digital realm. The press, in fact, was already calling Andreessen the new Bill Gates, and the assumption was that Andreessen could claim that title by dethroning its current owner. There was just one problem with that scenario, of course. Why would Bill Gates willingly cede his title? Why would he let his platform be supplanted by a new one without a fight? It happens that all along there was one other very important reason why Jim Clark and Netscape management had raced headlong towards an IPO. They were terrified of Microsoft. They knew that Netscape had to get as big as it could and gain as much market share and cash as possible before Bill Gates and Microsoft woke up to the internet in general and the potential of the web browser market in particular. In his autobiography, Jim Clark likened Bill Gates to the evil Lord Sauron from Lord of the Rings, quote, whose all-seeing eye searched ceaselessly for any threat to his tyranny, unquote. The press was loudly beating the drum that Netscape could be the new Microsoft. Bill Gates couldn't help but hear that, and hear it as a mortal threat to his own money-minting platform strategy of market dominance. Even Mark Andreessen, perhaps flush with his recent amazing success, started to join in and poke the sleeping dragon. Just a few weeks after the IPO, Andreessen was quoted in InfoWorld magazine saying that Netscape would turn Windows into, quote, a mundane collection of not entirely debugged device drivers. Those are a Silicon Valley version of fighting words. Jim Barksdale would say later, quote, I was 100% certain that eventually we were going to find ourselves alone in a dark alley with Microsoft. Bill and company don't like it when anyone else has success in the software business. End quote. The speed strategy had been partially due to Jim Clark's impatient nature and his desire to score for a second time and claim his rightful fortune. It had partially been a race to leapfrog Skyglass and the commercialization of the original Mosaic Code. But just as importantly, getting big fast had been a strategy for claiming a market right from under Bill Gates's nose. Gates would certainly be aware of it someday, and when he was, would want to claim that market for himself. So the mountain of cash that Netscape had raised in the IPO would be quickly put to use to arm the company for the inevitable clash with Microsoft. Again, CEO Barksdale, quote, The more rapidly we got out there and the faster we moved, the further we could put ourselves ahead of this behemoth that was going to try crushing us underfoot, end quote. They made it by the skin of their teeth. The first Microsoft web browser, which would eventually be called Internet Explorer, was released on August 16, 1995. Internet Explorer was based on the original Mosaic code, licensed, of course, from Spyglass. The corporate battle that would become known as the Browser Wars was joined exactly one week to the day after Netscape's IPO. <laughs> 
we'll have to leave the browser wars themselves for chapter two. But uh, to end this chapter, let's take a look at a funny little aside involving Jim Clark. By the time the browser wars got underway in earnest, Clark was already on his way out the door at Netscape. By early 1996, Clark was holding meetings, beginning the process of forming his new startup, which would initially be called Healthscape. It would later be renamed Healthion, and it is today known as WebMD. When Healthion IPO'd successfully in 1998, it would be Jim Clark's billion-dollar company number three. More than enough revenge, I would think, for all the wrongs that had been done to him at Silicon Graphics all those years ago. <laughs> 